Can you hear me? We're going to try to continuing the test. So, guys, the only way this is going to work is you guys remain quiet. Yeah, speaker's not loud, but it's loud enough that you can hear it as long as you're quiet. How are we doing? So guys, the only way that's gonna work. The only way that's gonna work. Oh yeah. All right. Um, one second. I think we're trying new speakers. Let me know. All right. Um, just some quick instructions while we're setting up the technical stuff. Thank you all for coming to the first Tech Talk in the UMass Tech Talk series. Um, the series is meant for a way for us to speak to companies without worrying about all the aspects of recruitment. You know, you can still connect with them if you're interested, but this is for the company to explain what they do and pass along any skills and um, that you would like to portray on to you. And if you have any questions, here right now. Once she's done presenting, there will be a Q&A. Thank oh. you again for coming. Also, help yourself with all the back there now. Cooking and drinks. And a sign sheet will be funny. Yep. Okay. Um, when you're ready. I'll start talking. Is that good? You guys can hear that well? Yep. Right. Awesome. As the speakers. Good. good. Are you getting okay. so much feedback? So I'm going to thank you and thanks so much for inviting me to speak today and thanks so much for everybody for showing up. Um, my name is Rex St. John. I work at Intel and I'm, I'm broadcasting from my home because in theory that's quieter. Um, and I am from Amherst. I grew up in Amherst. I went to Amherst High School. I went to UMass. Uh, I got a degree in marketing from UMass Eisenberg School of Management. Uh, I took exactly one computer science class and I disliked it so much that I swore off programming for several years until I realized that it is by far one of the most valuable skills you can combine with any other specific domain knowledge. So I took a very unconventional route, which was to teach myself to program. I started my own company. Uh, I built some games that got played millions of times around the world and then I went into Fortune 500 Enterprise Consulting for mobile applications and enterprise dashboards. Um, and after a few years of that, maybe five years, uh, I, I decided that I needed a role that was a combination of marketing and engineering. So I approached technical evangelism, which is what I do now for Intel. Um, at Intel, I probably went to around 60 events around the world. I, I, I take the Intel Edison, Intel Galileo, uh, and I will be taking the Intel QE, all of our inventor platforms, the different hackathons and workshops and conferences and trade shows. I work with a huge network of startups and partners that are building products on top of these products. Uh, I work with Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, IBM, SAP, and I, I loop their feedback into our future product and marketing development plans. So what, what started out as a degree, degree in marketing went through a, a huge detour into technical programming and then turned into this really extremely broad and varied technical marketing role that I have now. And I absolutely would never have expected any of this coming from where you guys are at right now, which is uh, either graduating or freshmen. And I'd actually be curious uh, how many freshmen are in the room right now uh, before I go. One, two, I can't see who else is there. So a couple. And uh, how many, uh, what's the split of uh, computer science majors? Raise your hand. Any computer science? Just one. Uh, electrical engineering. Mechanical engineering, and everybody else either undecided or um, all right. So that's interesting. So most of you are engineering. Is anybody not in engineering? All engineers. All right. So you guys chose wisely because engineering right now is when I when I was going to school, which was like 50 years ago in 2006. It was significantly less fun than it is right now. Uh, in fact, engineering has become by far the most fun thing you could ever imagine and possibly do. And at the time when I was in school, it was just, if you, you could either develop for Microsoft or I, I think that's about it. I don't even know if there's, you know, Google. It might have been like 30 people at the time. So now you have by far more opportunity than ever before and more combinations of different things you can get into uh, than I ever would have imagined. 
Um, so it's a really good time for you to be getting engineering degrees. Um, so that's that's who I am and what I do, what I do. And uh, I've got a deck here which is going to walk through exactly what my day to day role is, and uh, and what kinds of products and things Intel is working on that I, I get to work on. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here if I can. Uh, I can. All right. Can you see this? Yep. Okay. I'm going to hit the play button. Um, so this is my overview of Intel's inventor platforms. Um, that may be a confusing term. So the way Intel is divided is there's multiple different groups that are focused on different areas. And the group that I'm in is called the Maker Innovation Group. And we focus on generating, creating these single board computers and prototyping devices uh, that makers and hackers uh, can use to build projects and products. Um, so that's my contact information. If anybody wants to follow me on Twitter or send me an email, uh, feel free to write that down. Uh, it's just at Rex St. John. And I kind of gave an overview of what I do as a technical evangelist, and now I just I just joined this role as an inventor platform manager is what I'm calling myself. Um, so what Intel is doing is if in the 1960s, late 1960s, uh, there was this phenomenon in Silicon Valley called the Homebrew Computing Club. And what happened is you had the employees from the HPE, Compaq, Dells, the Shibas at the time, uh, the early Intel employees, and they're all concentrated in Silicon Valley. And these guys would get together and they would share their single board, their hobby computers that they built themselves. And out of this uh, homebrew computing club came Steve Jobs and Wozniak, uh, Bill Gates, all of the leading figures that are now CEOs or founders of all of our most famous companies were, were greatly engaged in this homebrew computing club. And this could only happen in Silicon Valley because the, the tools and skills were only in that place at that time. And what's happened over the last few years is computers have become so ridiculously cheap that we now have homebrew computing club in every city in America in the form of maker spaces. And in fact, we now have this gigantic maker movement, uh, millions of people taking these cheap devices and they're building their own products and projects and solving their own problems. They're talking about it online, they're building code, they're open sourcing projects. And Intel is incredibly interested in being involved in this. Because as we saw with the homebrew computing club, um, this has the potential to generate the next Apple computer, maybe dozens of them, maybe dozens of Apple computers. Nobody's quite sure what's going to happen now that these devices are now cheaper and more accessible and affordable to everyone. Um, so to sort of enter, enter this space, Intel has created a series of next generation processors. And this device that's being held up here is called the Intel Curie. Um, you'll see that uh, the way Intel sees this space is there's an entire continuum from very, very small, low energy, very cheap uh, computer chips, all the way up to extremely powerful chips that run in the data center. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, whenever you hear the word cloud computing, that is the sound of Intel making money. Uh, we're in the vast majority of servers around the world. Most of AWS runs on uh, Intel Xeon. I believe a lot of Azure does. Don't quote me on that. It's not quite my area. So whenever you hear the word cloud computing, it's probably running on Intel at some point. Uh, and then, Excuse me, Rex. Can I yeah. uh, ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, feel free we're to. Only, we're only we're only seeing your first slide. Oh, uh, oh man, what do I do about this? I updated to you see Intel architecture scales from your things slide. Well, the slide we are looking at says inventor platforms. Now we're looking at architecture scales. Okay. That doesn't seem to be updating. Okay, so maybe after I'll just like put it like this. And if at any time you have a question, just start shouting, and I'll I, I'll actually just leave more room to talk. Okay, um, zoom zoom out a little bit so we can see the whole slide. Zoom out right there. How That's good. That's okay. good. Yeah. Okay. It seems, it seems uh, Google Hangouts isn't so helpful with the uh, slide the full screen mode. Um, so you're seeing this this continuum of small chips to large chips, and at the very small end is the Quark series, and in the middle is the Intel Atom and the Core series. Um, so there's a broad range of applications running from uh, small chips that are in billions of different devices to large chips that are that are in hundreds of millions of devices, as is the case with the Xeon servers. Um, this Quark series is the new one for Intel. These very low low energy, low process, uh, low low cost processors are what the Internet of Things is going to be built on. And uh, you you may have heard the statistics, but everybody's projecting there's going to be 20 billion computers in the wild by 2020, or whatever whatever they're guessing it's going to be uh, this 
this this week. It, it seems to change every week. Uh, so the Quark series is meant to be the device that is in lot tons and tons and tons of different uh, smaller, low energy things like light bulbs and home appliances and robots and things like that. Uh, and it, they just announced these three in uh, November, so three different flavors of it. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, uh, but over here on the far right, this Quark SE, that is what the Intel Curie has inside of it. Um, the Intel Curie is meant for uh, wearable products, and if you, let me scroll ahead. So wearable products, and we've got these folks building different uh, uh, fashion accessories to show off what you can do with the Curie. And it's got a uh, gyro accelerometer, Bluetooth LE, and it's got this, uh, they're calling it a pattern matching accelerator. It's 128 neuron uh, neural network on a chip that's on the Curie where it can, it's expected to be able to detect and respond to gestures in real time. Uh, it can learn different gestures based on uh, what people are doing with the chip. And uh, they've got a, a whole variety of different videos that have been released to about uh, different potential applications with parkour and surfing and skiing and BMX biking, uh, and that's all available online. Um, this Atom series of chips, these are meant for, uh, so what happened was, backing up a little bit, what happened over the last seven years since the iPhone was introduced is these systems on a chip, which is a form of basically hybrid computing where you've got a I've got got a computer and it's composed of many different uh, chips computer chips doing different things so it'll have a GPU a CPU now we're seeing the addition of FPGAs and all these different chips coming together on this one tiny platform the size of a credit card and a lot of companies got incredibly good at producing these things uh, as the demand for mobile phones accelerated so everybody is now walking around with basically a supercomputer in their pocket, which also doubles as uh, a sensor hub. It's got 4G, 3G, LTE, uh, accelerometer, gyroscope. It, now they've got fingerprint sensors, GPS, GPRS. So you've got these incredibly powerful tiny computers in your pocket. And all the companies that uh, had a great experience in mobile, that sold a ton of mobile chips, uh, realize that these same chips are the exactly the technology that we're going to need for drones and robots and to make those drones and robots much cheaper. So the Atom series is Intel's play and entry into that field uh, for these systems on a chips, for those robots and drones and things of that nature uh, that are going to be coming increasingly common over the next few years as you guys graduate. And you're probably going to be working on these uh, kinds of applications uh, on this type of hardware yourself uh, in the near future. And we've got some technical stats there, if anybody cares, but I'll just, that's all online. Um, so all these systems on a chip, all these tiny, low-cost, low-energy processors, um, they're great and all, but nobody, it's, it's the applications that are really interesting. What are you going to do with these different processors? And chances are uh, the people in this room are going to be finding new applications for all of these technologies, which uh, we probably haven't even thought of yet. Uh, this picture, Intel has been producing these arachnid reference designs, and last year, I think they debuted 20 of these things on stage at the last IDF in August, and you can actually download and build your own spider using the reference design that they posted online. Um, so they've got all kinds of different spiders, and they're running their own uh, inverse kinematic engines, and you can control them, and they've got video and stuff online. And the cost for these things has really plummeted down from $10,000 to as low as five hundred, dollars and it seems to be getting even cheaper over time. Um, so right now, uh, over the last two years, I've been working primarily on the Edison. I brought it to probably 60 events. Uh, I traveled all around the world. I went to Hack UMass. I went to Hack Holyoke. I went to a ton of collegiate hackathons, and I brought uh, lots and lots of Intel Edisons, which were released about a year and a half ago in September. And what it is, it's an Atom, Atom chip, which is that system on a chip that I showed you earlier. Uh, uh, dual core Atom, uh, 500 megahertz, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, low energy, 32-bit microcontroller. Uh, can you guys still see what I'm doing? I'm seeing a waiting for people to join link. Hello? Hey, can you hear me? Sorry, we yep. lost connection. Okay. All right, so when did it go offline? Because I can't. I wasn't paying attention. Two minutes, three minutes. Spider robot. Spider robot. All right, so spider robot. Uh, spider robot is powered by Intel Edison. Um, one gig of RAM, four gig of storage. It's got a microprocessor. It's got a Quark chip in there, 
And I've been taking these across the country and I work with a huge variety of startups that are building products on top of this. Um, and this comes with a larger Arduino breakout board and it's got a variety of different IO here. Uh, we have lots of different companies that are building uh, extensions and expansions to this thing. Uh, we have SparkFun building all these stackable blocks that are put together uh, to build different robots and uh, accelerometer-based projects. Um, so we've got a whole ecosystem around the Edison just by itself. Uh, and up and coming is the Curie, uh, which is a 32-bit Quark SE microcontroller that I showed you earlier. It's got Bluetooth, six-axis accelerometer. It's smaller than ever. The price point is going to be below $10, which is announced publicly. It doesn't have an official release date, uh, but you can buy it now in the form of the Arduino 101, which is the first Intel-based Arduino product that has hit the market. So it's, this has a Curie on it. Uh, it's got the accelerometer and all that working. Uh, the pattern matching accelerometer is not enabled in software, so you can't really uh, mess with that at this time, but you can get these boards. Um, uh, we have a variety of different companies that are building single board computers on top of the Atom form factor. Uh, this, this company just launched, they're called Latte Panda. They just uh, raised something like $700,000 kickstarting this board. Uh, we've got the Upboard, which is another Atom based uh, chip to compete against Raspberry Pi uh, and devices of that nature. Uh, these have been a very interesting sleeper hit. Uh, the Intel Nux and Compute Sticks. We, Intel actually produces these, which is unusual. Normally, we let the Dells or Asus's or Compaq uh, do, all, do all the productization on top of the chips. But Intel actually produces these super small computers, and they just released a new updated one that's meant for video games. Um, and we've seen people doing really strange things with these. There's a, an article in, I want to say it was Forbes or Bloomberg, there was a guy who used to work for Elon Musk, and he got fed up with it, and he quit, and he started building his own self-driving car kit, which he plans to sell for around $1,000. And he was doing it by uh, using these nuts in a car. So we've got self-driving cars being built on this kind of thing. Um, I should mention that the Google car itself has four Xeon chips in it, in, in it uh, powering it. So uh, they're increasingly building self-driving cars and things with the more powerful uh, chips. So all of this technology and hardware is really interesting, but the part that's also very interesting is the software. And I think as an industry, we've learned over and over again that if you make really great hardware, it's only half done until there's software to actually make it easy to interact with and make, make it ex accessible to developers so they can build projects on top of it. So what we've been doing is we've been spending a lot of time uh, providing a really easy hardware access layer so that anybody with any background, whether it's Python, JavaScript, Arduino, C, C++, you can get one of these hardware prototyping boards and you can connect it to sensors, you can program it however you want. Um, so Node.js has absolutely taken off as a, a robotics uh, programming language, which is really odd when you think about it. Uh, but at the same time, it saves people a ton of money and energy to be able to use all those Node modules when they're programming these robots. And now I'm in a situation where I actually have companies building drones on the Intel Edison, and they're using Node.js to, to power the flight core of a drone, which is really unusual. And this is something that you're going to see over the next few years. Um, so we've got this hardware access layer called LibMRAW, and it's portable between all the most common hobby boards on the market, and it lets you just really easily connect with all these different sensors. So there's hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, hobby and industrial sensors on the market. And being able to program these with Python, JavaScript, Node.js, C++, Arduino uh, in a consistent way is really a new thing for this industry. So what we're, what we're trying to do is to make this easier and more accessible and more portable than ever before. So with this Libron UPM library, which is the sensor uh, equivalent, which are all open source, by the way, you can now do that. We've got a new entry into the field called Soleta Project. It's solettaproject.org, and it's another way for you to program your hardware using whatever uh, programming environment that you want. Um, so some of the slides I'm about to get into are more of the nature of things you should check out if you're really curious about this space. Um, there's a ton of technology coming at uh, effectively the Internet of Things and robotics, and there's a lot of new emerging technology stacks and skill sets that you can work on and adopt uh, as you look at careers in this space. 
And one of the ones that keeps coming up is robot operating system. I'm actually curious, are any of you using robot operating system right now? Ross? No. no. Yeah. Um, so I'm working with several robotics companies, and this, the, this as a skill set seems to be an emerging trend. So people are wanting uh, folks that are super skilled at Ross uh, to, they want to hire them to build robots. Um, so it's, it's not just one tool, it's several different tools. And it's tools that are optimized to work in a distributed fashion um, to en enable easier use, easier production of robots. So check out Ross, it's ross.org if you're interested in robotics. Um, kind of the drone equivalent of that is drone code. So there's numerous companies in the industry that are on a, a joint alliance to promote drone code and the standardization of these common uh, flight controller uh, software layers that we're going to need for all these drones. Uh, Intel, Qualcomm, and a whole bunch of other guys are uh, backers of drone code. So I would check that out. Again, it's not a single tool. It's a collection of tools for programming drones. And let me know if you have any questions along the way. I'm just going to, I've got a few slides. Questions, anyone? No. no. So check out drone code if you like drones. Um, Johnny Five, so in about 2012, a guy named Luke Waldron felt that uh, Node.js was going to have a huge impact on the world of robotics. So he introduced this framework called Johnny Five, and he's done a really fantastic job of making this API very usable and accessible. And I teach this at many of the workshops that I run. So check out johnny5.io and look at the API that he's built. And you can program many different kinds of robots using Node.js very, very easily with this. And uh, it's, it's really taken off, and I, I see a lot of people using this in all kinds of different applications. Um, there's a company in Los Angeles called The Hybrid Group. Uh, they produce three tools. One is r2.io, the other is cylon.js, and the other is gobot.io. So what these let you do is program uh, hardware using Ruby, Node.js again, and the Go programming language. So, they've been, so again, you've got all kinds of options to program hardware in new ways that you couldn't before. Um, so there's a study floating around at Intel that we did where we compared the number of embedded hardware engineers who are on the market, people who know the code all the way down to the hardware, can write drivers, know C, C++, and versus the number of web-based or server-based programmers who know programming languages like Python, Go, JavaScript. And what we found is there's one embedded programmer for every 16 uh, of the other classes of programmer. So what we're going to see in coming years is as these hardware access layers like uh, Johnny5, uh, like LibMRA, like the Soleto project, like R2, Cylon, and Gobot, as these come along, this is going to enable a whole new level of productivity. It's going to be cheaper than ever for companies to build uh, hardware projects through software, and it's going to allow a much greater range of expression and different kinds of uh, products to be built as the talent that is available that is capable of building these is more accessible to companies. So these, this hybrid group is another uh, step in that direction. Uh, another trend that we're seeing is we're seeing an emergence of uh, hardware which is comes built in connected to the cloud by default. You turn on the device and it instantly connects to the cloud and it's secured at every stage uh, to the cloud and back. And um, this kind of device, uh, VMware, VMware has a, a phrase they call uh, cloud native software. I'm kind of borrowing it, but we, we're seeing cloud native hardware as well. Um, so you're seeing these operating systems that live on a device and are also directly connected to the cloud to let you manage not one device at a time, but thousands of different devices. So with Pulsar Linux and Wind River Rocket, and there's a startup called Resin.io as well that I didn't include in this deck, uh, you can now deploy hundreds, thousands of devices and manage them the way you would manage a website. Uh, you could have a team of programmers that are all sharing a single GitHub repository. And when you deploy to that GitHub repository, kind of like in the same way you use uh, Heroku now, uh, you can push updates, live updates to edge devices, robots, drones, and things like that. So this is a very exciting emerging uh, area. Um, so a few of the things that uh, people are building with devices like the Edison and the Atom Core. Um, this is Skyworks. They built a cloud-based drone uh, authoring environment. This is all in Python. So it's called, they've rebranded 
since to DroneSmith. So you can log in and you can program your drone in the cloud using this set of tools. And then they also built a drone controller, a UAV controller on the Intel Edison. And they built this device called, the, or a drone called the Quark 2. And what's really cool about uh, DroneSmith is that you've got a simulator. So instead of uh, figuring out what bugs your system has by crashing your drone into the river, you can kind of simulate your drone and its behavior and uh, program it and without actually risking your hardware. Um, this is a company that's in Seattle. They're called Robobug. They built a, uh, <laughs> it's a robotics gaming platform. And when I first saw this thing, I, I, I didn't think it would possibly be popular, but they've actually sold so many now that they can't even keep up uh, with demand for this. And it's using an Edison inside of it, and then it's also using Ross robot operating system. You control it with a PlayStation 3 controller, and it's got a, a webcam on it. And they put these things, I'm not sure, they, they've, he's been selling these to these live gaming houses where they uh, got, what's it called, Airsoft, indoor Airsoft. And it lets people at home participate in Airsoft battles from remotely using these drones. Um, uh, we've got different dresses and uh, wearable fashions, fashion designs being built. There's a very talented uh, industrial designer named Anouk Weeprecht, and she built this thing called the Spider Dress. This has been around for maybe a year and a half, two years now. And it, it sort of detects if people are near you and it tries to attack you. Uh, if you come into too close proximity with the wearer. Uh, this was the adrenaline dress, which has just debuted, and this is using the Intel Curie uh, to power it. Uh, we've got people building home automation gateways, really micro small ones, uh, stackable gateways that are modular using Intel Edison. And we've got this company called Mason Objects. And what they're doing is they're um, making it easy to 3D print and make smart objects at home whenever you want them. So each one of these modular blocks contains an Intel Edison and some sensors, and you can download 3D uh, print designs from their website and then embed these modules into them to give them intelligence. Uh, we got a company called Orbi, and they built uh, effectively a Sphero, and it's got a camera in it, and it, you can roll it around your house, and it's like a home security system that you can control remotely and move around. It streams 30 frames per second over the local network using uh, HD, HD video. Uh, so kind of interesting developments there. Um, so those are the few of the projects that uh, people are building with these various vendor platforms. And this year when Curie arrives, uh, I'm expecting to see a lot more interesting projects of this nature and uh, many, many, many more applications that uh, I haven't even thought of yet. We've seen students building some really cool stuff. Uh, we had students at Portland State University they built a cold gas rocket stabilization system, uh, which is if you launch a rocket, um, it they tend to spin, and the systems for preventing them from spinning involve shooting glass out the side to stabilize these rockets as they're in flight. And they use the Edison to build one that only costs like $10,000. So uh, traditionally, uh, devices like that might have cost $500,000, and we're now seeing those prices come down as the tools and software become more available and cheaper than ever before. Um, so that was my interview, my quick overview of what uh, what's going on with the Intel and Venture platforms. Um, I'm sort of curious what kinds of projects uh, people in the room have been building and what technologies they've been using. Uh, if anybody wants to volunteer something that they've built or they're, or they're interested in building. Anyone have any projects they'd like to share? Either it be a project you're currently working on during the semester or a project you did during a hackathon. What is that? Nothing. I think okay. everyone. <laughs> you want to go? go? I'm wearing a hacky master after you. <laughs> yeah, I was a hacky master. <laughs> I'm a freshman currently, so I'm sort of like checking things out. I haven't really planned on anything yet. Next semester, though, I plan on uh, developing something. Are there any particular domains you're interested in going into in the room? Is there, are there areas that uh, you plan on working in or building projects in? This is supposed to be like completely open. He's not like recruiting you right now. You're allowed to like <laughs> ask normal questions. Medical now. sector. Which sector? Medical. Where medical where? sector. Where? So what kinds of projects uh, intrigue you about medical? Uh, 
Currently, I'm working on a research project using RFID uh, to keep track of uh, patients who have dementia and so to keep track of their pills and everything. Okay. So, so uh, small things like that to help track uh, statistics for patients as well. So what programming languages are you using for it? Uh, right now, it's just MATLAB. It's, it's, it's data analysis. Okay. So, yeah. And you're not building the hardware itself? No, we're using current existing RFID. Very cool. Um, so it seemed like a, a good amount of the room was involved in either electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. Um, so are you involved in 3D printing robotics drones currently? Uh, not currently, but I did do a project a while ago, uh, 3D printing uh, speaker shells and making those. Okay. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I actually have a whole other deck that I was thinking of uh, showing you. I'm not. I'm not. It's a new deck that I put together last week, and it's effectively uh, advice I've accumulated over the years about um, what I learned are best practices as an engineering career. So, if people don't have questions, I would be interested in working through that deck. Sure. Yes. All right. So let's let's so, get a show. You want to see the new deck? I think the man show us the new deck, deck wants to be deck. seen. All right, I guess the deck needs to be seen. Um, it's a nice deck. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can't. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the group is really loving the amount of companies and a lot of projects you're showing them. All right. So. There's a lot going on in this space. I mean, you couldn't be graduating at a better time. It's absolutely amazing. All right, so I'm going to show this deck. And let me share my screen here. And this is actually online if you want to see it yourself. It's Habits of Great Engineers. Can you see this? Yes. All right. So I don't know if I expand this thing. Can you see it now? No. no. All right, so I'm not going to expand it. I'm going to leave it like this. All right, I have to turn the screen share back on. Uh, so this is a deck that I, I started right, I, so I, this started as an advice section uh, that I was gonna add on to that, that previous deck I just showed you. And it kind of got out of hand. <laughs> like I just kept adding stuff to it. And I, I started working, talking to other engineers that I work with and they had all these ideas and they told me to put them in there. And the question was, what would I tell myself if I was in your position right now? And what are the habits that I would work on building uh, if I was starting an engineering career uh, in your shoes at this moment? Um, I, I had, like I said, I had a very unusual path where I started out in marketing and then I taught myself the program. And I don't think a lot of folks, uh, maybe I think maybe 50% of the people in the industry may, may come out that way. Um, but along the way, I, I had the extreme honor of working with some absolutely fantastic engineers that are some of the best people in the industry. And I learned a lot from them. And while I may never be as great an engineer as they are, I, I wrote down a lot of what I observed them doing. And I, I came up with what I call an operating system for how to become a great engineer. So here's what I have. And these are students from uh, HackGT, and they built a, a, a wearable glove on top of the Intel Edison. You already know that. So here's the agenda. Um, I'll just walk right through it. It's not going to make any sense right now, but I'm going to pose the question about what it is to be a great engineer, and I'm going to suggest an answer. Then I'm going to introduce a series of models and principles to help people become what uh, I observe, I've observed as uh, traits of a great engineer. Um, so here's the question, which I've covered already. It's how do I become a really, really great engineer? And I, I kind of have a tongue-in-cheek definition down in the bottom. An engineer is a person who deliberately seeks, seeks out opportunities to be uh, confused and ignorant about different topics. So how do I become a great engineer? And this is a really simple answer, but it actually makes a lot of sense. It's you want to adopt the behaviors, habits, values, motivations, skills, experiences, thought processes, attitudes that really great engineers have. And later on in this deck, I'm going to talk about what those are. Um, so a couple key concepts. An operating system is something that you're familiar with already in terms of computer science. It's, uh, it's the, the most important software running on a computer. It's the first thing that starts when you turn the computer on. It, it, co it 
it consists of a collection of different programs that run on the operating system. And I, I've observed that great engineers have a personal operating system for how they think and act that lets them accelerate beyond uh, normal engineers or average engineers. And I'm going to talk about how that works in a little bit. And then I wanted to introduce this concept called reflection. If you've studied uh, software, uh, this concept of reflection is one of the most powerful capabilities of a programming language. Uh, it's the ability to examine and modify its own structure and behavior. So this is a program that can look at how it's running right now, and then it can rewrite itself to run even better. So great engineers engage in reflection with some regularity to examine and modify their beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors in order to become even better engineers. And it's an ongoing process. Um, so this is your brain. It's, it consists of 100 million neurons and mostly dedicated to looking at cat pictures at some points in time. And it is the most complicated object in the known universe, and it has absolutely no uh, instruction manual. So I wanted to propose a really simple model of what your brain is. It's very much like your iPhone or Android phone. It's, it's got an operating system, and it has a bunch of applications installed on it. Uh, experiences, beliefs, values, attitudes, habits, skills, fears, these are all very similar to applications installed on your phone. And what you, what you get as you become more experienced is the ability to introspect and say, what's installed on my brain? And what do I need to get rid of? And what do I need to add to make myself a much stronger engineer? So this is an ongoing process that you're gonna do forever throughout your career. And uh, the key thing that I wanted to focus on is you absolutely have to get rid of everything in your brain that is of a fixed nature. Um, I work with some incredibly smart people. Uh, I have a marketing degree and I'm surrounded by people with multiple PhDs who have dozens of patents. I work with a guy that's got 50 patents. Um, he's exited multiple companies. And uh, what's amazing to me is these people with PhDs and patents, they still suffer from uh, anxiety and imposter symbol syndrome. And they suffer from fear that what they're doing is not good enough or that they're never gonna be smart enough to be uh, a great engineer. I'm telling you, uh, I don't want to see you guys when you're 30, 35, 40, you're suffering from the same uh, a mental trauma that I see some of these people I work with suffering from. So I'm telling you to un uninstall that app right now, and what you want to install is a growth mindset. Um, there have been numerous studies which have shown that if you take a very talented child and you coach them, hey, you're very talented, you're very smart, and if you keep telling them this message, at some point they're going to stop trying and they're going to start relying on what they feel is their talent. And when they do that, they become very fragile. Uh, when they encounter um, an adverse circumstance or a problem they can't overcome, they blame it on their own stupidity. And that's exactly the wrong way. So some of the most talented people are the most prone to this behavior because they've been hearing this message that you're smart, you're capable their whole lives. And instead, you want to uninstall that and you want to think, my brain is exactly like a muscle. If I learn the right ways to work it out, I'm going to get smarter and I can overcome, I can learn anything. Uh, so the growth mindset is the ultimate app to install. Um, so another observation is I found that engineers grow like trees. Uh, every one to two years, you may move dramatically between different technology stacks. Uh, you might change problem domains. You might have to learn new programming languages and new systems. And it's, it's like clockwork. And I've, had, I've, I've gone through several of these myself. I started out in marketing, which I'd call the core ring. And then I learned to program flash games. And then I realized I could wait, make more, a hell of a lot more money programming flex applications. And then I realized flex applications are dying and now I need to learn to program iOS and Android. And then I realized I like technical evangelism, so I had to learn that. So it's just every one to two years, I had to completely throw away everything I knew and learn something new. And you're gonna look like this by the, you know, maybe if you're 50, you're gonna have a dozen different layers like this. You're gonna have to learn over and over and over again. Uh, so this is just a uh, kind of a, uh, a funny example of how an engineer grows over time over here on the right. Um, so you're going to go through what I'm call, calling the ignorance cycle. You're going to spend a lot of time over on the left, which is this stupid dog, and he's saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. And then you're going to transition over the course of a year or two into, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm doing. And if you're actually bent on growing as an engineer, you're going to insist on adopting a new technology and you're going to go back to the, I have no idea what I'm doing. And you're going to do this over and over and over again. And every single time you do it, you're going to grow another ring as an engineer. Um, so here's the phases of the ignorance cycle. 
Uh, you're going to get thrown into a new project or a new job uh, where you're going to encounter a problem that you've never had before. You're going to feel really confused and uh, ignorant for three to six months, maybe longer. And then you're going to go reach this magical phase, which I'm calling you, you're going to come to know what you don't know, which is a weird way of saying you're going to know uh, of all the topics that you need to know, but you're not, you're not going to have any depth in them. And then uh, I've noticed this phenomenon, which is you're going to build your own degree. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about what that means. And you're just going to repeat this over and over again. And a really great engineer knows that this is the cycle, and they get really good at repeating it, and they get much, much quicker at it. So when you first arrive in a new job, you're going to know something. Maybe you know data structures, algorithms, uh, Python, and you're going to be challenged to this huge abyss of what you don't know. And when I joined Intel, I knew a lot about software and mobile applications. And I didn't know anything about microcontrollers, embedded Linux, real-time operating systems. I didn't know about IoT protocols, but I kept, everybody around me is talking about these things and I have no idea what they're doing. So uh, I'm just immersed in this, in this world that I have absolutely no familiar with and I just feel really, really lost. And after two years, I feel more like this, where I've got some, everything that I've been hearing about, I'd taken action so that it became stuff that I knew about and was familiar to me. But in between, from six to 12 months, I spent a lot of time here. Um, so down in the corners, it's what I know. And then uh, you're going to start feeling illuminated on these new topics of areas that you need to have depth in, but you have no idea either how to get the depth or you just, you just haven't experienced them before. So for me, it was embedded Linux and microcontrollers, Arduino Formata, and there's dozens of different technologies and terms that I'd never heard of before. Um, so after six months, I've noticed uh, continually when I join a new role, I, I become aware of what I don't know, and then I can do the corrective phase, which is you can build your own degree. Um, and what I do is I compile a list of educational materials on each of these topics, and I, you know, I just gave it a, a funny name here, Arduino Formata 253, Embedded Linux for Dummies, and Introduction to Microcontrollers 101. Uh, so I, I found that I, I didn't have the time or bandwidth to go back to school or to pay somebody to teach me this stuff. So I put it on myself that I'm going to build my own coursework. And at the time, when I first uh, realized that this kept happening to me as an engineer, uh, I had this idea that I was going to go back to school. I'm going to go, you know, maybe to Seattle University or University of Washington. And I had this experience where I called the University of Washington and I said, hey, I've got a marketing degree and I've been programming for three years, but I need more computer science fundamentals. Uh, I'm being held by, back by this. And the guy at the other end of the phone basically laughed at me. And he said, oh, that's so funny. We only have 100 slots and we only, we only let people from the undergrad graduate program into them. And then I was like, well, that's too bad. I can't go to UW. Maybe I can go to Seattle U. And I talked to my employer and I was like, hey, this, this, this university, Seattle U, they're going to let me pay them to get a night master's in computer science. Are you guys willing to help me? And they said, absolutely not. We're not going to pay for that. So I was left with this. I can't go to the UW and I, and nobody wants to help pay for this other education. So how about I just go on their curriculum, their website, and I figure out all the courses that they have in their computer science program. I buy all the used textbooks and I read them myself and I teach myself all of this. So I did that. And I realized that this was a great practice. It's a great model to use as you grow as an engineer. You're going to keep finding different topics that you know nothing about. And you're probably not going to want to go back to school. You're not going to have time to go back to school. And you're, nobody's going to want to pay for it. Um, so having said all that, those are the, th the, the models of, uh, that I wanted to introduce. And here's the part where I just go into what are the behaviors, values, skills, experiences that I've seen great, really great engineers have over the years. Um, and this is going to be the more uh, uh, down-to-earth part of it. Um, it's expected that you're going to feel ignorant for long periods of time, and I mean ignorant in a good way. You're going to feel confused. You're going to enter new topic areas, and you're not going to know what's going on, and you're going to be surrounded by people who you feel are much smarter than you. And they aren't smarter than you. They've just been doing it longer. Um, so expect this over and over again. And in fact, seek out opportunities to feel this way, because uh, that's how you know you're actually growing. Um, I don't understand this, I must be stupid. Uh, I still hear people saying this, even at Intel. Uh, and replace that attitude with, if I don't understand it, it's not being explained very well. Uh, I found that the people who are smartest in engineering are often 
the least qualified to communicate what they know. Uh, so in a lot of cases, you want to seek out many, many different explanations about how things work. You don't want to just stick with a canonical text. And ideally, you actually want to write your own explanations because that is, that is uh, one of the best ways to learn. Uh, school is never over, sorry. Uh, being an engineer, you are in school forever. Uh, you always have to study, you always have to read books, and you have to continually learn. Um, the code getting written is rarely the biggest problem, and I've seen this one over and over again. Every single company, and I've been at companies that are super overstaffed on engineering resources. They had tons and tons of engineers, and yet they still couldn't move in a productive direction because while they were writing a ton of code, and it was very good code, and it had all the tests written, the whole company was pointed in the wrong direction, and they weren't communicating internally, and people weren't doing customer research. And I've actually rarely seen a company where the biggest problem was that the code wasn't being written or the code wasn't being written well enough. And in fact, it's all the human layers over the code that are often the biggest, the biggest uh, obstructions to actually getting projects built. So that's something I've seen over and over again. And what's really weird is that most tech companies interview engineers as though this isn't the case. So a lot of what I, the most effective engineers are good at is communication, and uh, they'll, they'll talk to people. And a lot of tech companies just want to hear about quick start and white, whiteboarding interviews. So there's a huge mismatch between uh, the skills of actually getting all the work done and the, the technical know-how. I'm not sure when that's ever going to stop, but it's, it's been a consistent thing that I've seen. Um, rules are made by other people. <laughs> Uh, you are a people too, and you can make your own rules. So that's that's just relatively generic advice, but it's incredibly true. Uh, read a book, and uh, I have a, a follow up to this statement, which is don't Google it. And I'll show, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, despite the fact that we have the internet and we have unlimited free courseware and articles and GitHub repositories, there's still absolutely no replacement for a really highly constructed book that is written by a domain expert that has spent an incredible amount of time thinking about how to structure an approach to material. So I have read a tremendous amount of tech blogs and I've Googled and I've stacked overflowed and I've just come to the conclusion that nothing replaces a really great book. Uh, don't Google it. Um, this is gonna run counter to the vast majority of what a lot of engineers uh, spend most of their time doing. Uh, when you first encounter a programming language problem, you're going to probably spend a lot of time Googling answers. But at some point, this becomes a crutch and it becomes almost destructive because it prevents you from actually drilling in deeper into the topic into which you are, you are continually Googling. So I would recommend Googling when you first encounter something, but trying to work towards building, building, building out a structured programming of developing deep knowledge in the topic and instead of just uh, continually scotch taping your way through uh, a lack of knowledge on something. Uh, I cover this a little bit, and I, I believe this is very true, which is you're going to have to create your own degree every two years. And every time I go through these six-month to two-year cycle, uh, when I sit down and I write out everything I don't know, and then I start uh, collecting all the materials, and I get it into one place, and I just spend a weekend or three days reading through it all, and uh, I've always found that this has been a very productive uh, habit to have. Um, this one is incredibly powerful, and the sooner you start doing this on a regular basis, the, the better you're going to be happy with your career. Uh, you want to write your own job description. You literally want to sit down and you say, what do I like doing all day long? What, uh, what are the list of things, and what are the things I'm good at? What are the things I hate doing, and what are the things I never want to do again? And then once you've written your own job description, Go look online, and you can just, I mean, there's tons of jobs online. Just go on Craigslist, go on LinkedIn, go on Glassdoor, and just read job descriptions for a day. And look for what, you're going to find a job description that resonates, and look at what you just wrote, which is what you like to do, what you have done, and what you see yourself doing. And then find your, go find your ideal job. And then compare what you have right now to your ideal job, and you're going to find areas where you're probably lacking and go and fill those areas in. When I first became a technical evangelist, I went through an interview loop with a, a competing company to Intel Mashery, which is the subsidiary of Intel I joined. And I went through a loop and I didn't get the job. And I realized that 
The reason I didn't get the job is because I had five out of the ten things that I needed. And companies are very, they seem to be very checklist oriented. If they have a list of ten things they need you to do, and you only have five, chances are they're probably not going to hire you for that role in many cases. So I took the job description, and I said, all right, I've, I have these technical skills that they wanted, but they also wanted me to have a public GitHub repository. They wanted proof that I went to events. They wanted proof that I gave technical talks. They wanted proof that I wrote technical content, and I completely failed in all those categories. So I spent six months, and I filled in all those blanks. And then when I applied to Mastery, they hired me almost on the spot because I hit all 10 out of 10 uh, of the bullet points of my dream job. So reverse engineer your, your dream job. Go find it right now and go fill in what you're missing. Um, uh, don't be constrained by your job description. And I found this really common as an engineer where I get hired as an engineer and they'd want 40% uh, of my capability and they just want to pay me for that and everything else they're not terribly interested in. And at some point that became very constraining. Uh, so you're going to have all these different capabilities that extend well beyond what a company might want to pay you to do. So don't neglect that. Uh, can look for opportunities to grow into those areas. Uh, if you every time you learn something new, write it down and share it. Tell it to somebody. Write a presentation. Make a blog post. Uh, make a habit out of that. It, it feels really good and it's very positive to to get uh, new concepts into your own language because it helps you learn them better. Um, you can talk to anybody and learn anything at any time. Uh, a lot of people I work with, uh, they feel constrained. You know, Maybe they've only ever worked at one company, and they're used to having a management structure, and they're used to having a set of targets that they're managed to. And they think that they have to ask permission to talk to, talk to people outside of their organization. Uh, in most cases, I found you never need permission to talk to anybody, to reach out to anybody at any time, and have a discussion with them. And it's one of the most interesting habits to go make a habit out of talking to people that you think are interesting and to learn what they learn, they know. Um, go to hackathons. Uh, I found um, when I did take a computer science programming class at UMass long before I had taught myself everything about it, uh, I, I was taking Java 101 at UMass. And I think t I went to class for about two weeks. And it was so horribly boring and I didn't understand it. Uh, that I, I never went back to class. Uh, instead, what I did was I, I decided I was going to build my own game. And I worked on a project for two weeks. And I learned so much in those two weeks of building that side project that I was able to basically pass all the exams and get A's. And this kind of resulted in the realization that I learn much, much faster when I work on my own projects and I teach myself than I ever learned uh, sitting and listening passively. Um, so I found that personal projects are one of the, the most interest, quickest ways to get knowledge. And a hackathon is kind of like a personal, two weeks of personal project uh, constructed in, uh, constricted into a single weekend or long weekend. Uh, hackathons are awesome. Uh, you can get paid to go, tra you can get uh, re travel reimbursements to go anywhere in the country, meet thousands of people, go work on all kinds of different cool technology. Uh, this is a new phenomenon, and if I had, I wish I had uh, had this when I went to school because I would have gone to as many of them as I could. Uh, it's a really great way to learn very quickly. Uh, find your people, and I, I borrowed this from somewhere. I can't remember where it was. Um, find your people. <laughs> so be willing to go as far as you have to go to find people like you and work with those people. Uh, if you have to go to a city, be willing to move to find these people. Um, because if you don't find them, you're going to, you, as an engineer, you may wind up with this, which is uh, if teamwork means that you do all the work and share, and, and share all the credit with everyone, then you're probably not surrounded by your, t your people. So avoid this phenomenon of being the one that does all the work and sharing, sharing all the credit. You should be working with people that are as pulling as hard as you are uh, and working as hard as you are. Um, insist on knowing how it works all the way down to the metal. Uh, every technology has a full stack from end to end, and the great, really great engineers I worked with knew all the way down to the compiler and to the, the microprocessor and all the way to the cache. Uh, they, they knew this from the metal all the way up to the software, and then some really fancy ones even knew the business and marketing side as well. And those people tend to drive Teslas and uh, ride in boats to work, the people that I know who are like that. Uh, knew the whole whole technology stack in the marketing and the business side as well. 
Um, my final thoughts, I only have two more slides left, and it looks like we're running out of time. Uh, I have this thing I call the chair principle. Uh, as an engineer, you're going to be sought after by millions of different recruiters and companies, and everybody's going to be chasing after you, and they're all going to be trying to offer you jobs. And when you dig under the surface of many of these, you're going to find that you're only looking at a 5 to 15% gain. Uh, maybe it's a slight title bump to, see, to senior, but it's a mild sal salary bump. Um, and you, or it's, you know, it's basically the same job, but slightly more pay. And I'm going to tell you to avoid horizontal movement like that, uh, like the plague. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, it's, it's not worth it. You should, if you have a new opportunity, you should look at it and you say, how far out of my chair am I jumping as a result of this opportunity? How exciting am, am, am I about it? It's, it's more than just about the money. It's the number of technologies, emerging technologies, the team, the physical location you get to work in. If you aren't 50 to 1,000% better by going from your current job to that job, then don't bother. And final thoughts, there's going to be a ton of people uh, coming after engineers like yourselves, and they're going to want a discount. Uh, and what I found when I ran my own business and my own startup is there's a ton of people that will waste your time because they want to drive a Ferrari, but they want to drive it for $15,000. And the, the, the world is filled with people like this that want a discount. They, asking you for a discount is free for them. Don't give them a discount. Uh, the Ferraris are expensive because they're awesome. Uh, if you're not flying out of your chair because it's a 50 to a thousand percent better deal then don't bother uh, And so that's it. That's my uh, Lessons from observing uh, Great engineers over time and it looks like we're out of time and let me know if you have any questions This deck is online if you want to read it yourself uh, It's slides.com slash Rex st. John. That's the first deck So let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise. Thanks so much for having me uh, and that's it and thanks for uh, Showing up. Does anyone have any questions before he goes? We should give him a round of applause. Yep. All right. Thank you again. Um, is it possible for you to send me the two decks so I can send the yeah. emails to all the students who came here giving them the decks as well? Would you like me to include your email just in case anyone has any further follow-up questions? Yeah, sure. They're in the decks. You can just get them out of there, but I'll, I'll add my email. Sounds great. Thank you awesome. again. Thank you so Thank much. You much. You. Have a good night. All right. So thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to let you know that there's another tech talk <laughs> happening in five minutes. Barnstorm Studio is going to be talking about 3D printing, patent, patenting your technology and IP, and how to use toy tech and other small technology to create innovative.